Brother Gene speaking to you from the Suva metropolitan area in Fiji. We started by talking about body, soul, and spirit. Man is, the Bible teaches us, a three-part being. And this is mirror, a mirror of God's declaration in Genesis chapter 1 when he said, Let us make man in our image. Now we might think that that means that somehow we do resemble him physically. There is a possibility that is true. But in fact, the Bible teaches us that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one. And yet they are three distinct personalities, if you will. Now that is a mystery that you either take by faith or you go bonkers with. Because it's not going to change for because of what, how we feel or respond to God. He said, let us make man in our image. And God is infinite. We may be able to imagine something, but we will never understand what is completely outside of our realm of experience or our ability to comprehend. There are things in life God demands that you accept his word for. That means take by faith. And for fallen man, that is a huge problem. Because you see, we are self-willed individuals in this first identity that we have when we are born. Now, our, as I explained last time, God gave us a spirit that matches and is integrated with our soul body complex that we got from our parents through DNA, but he created our spirit. And like we said last time, our spirit is complex and it has different parts. We have our personality, which is our unique identity from God. We have a conscience. We have intuition. We also have gifts and callings that he placed within us so that he would, we would be able to function in the world in which he places us. There's another couple of things though that I believe are part of our spirit. And this is important because your spirit is your program center. Depending upon what you believe in your spirit, you will act out. Now psychologists in the late 20th century came up with a lot of theories and they want us to believe that you are just a mind and a body. Uh, but that's not what God teaches us through his word. We are complex individuals and our body-soul complex is difficult to sort out. And it takes a long time. If you just observe yourself and the faculties that you are given, you can begin to analytically discover who you are. But it's easier if you have someone tell you, have you considered this? And that's what I'm doing for you tonight, is saying, consider this. Because the programs of your spirit, psychologists said, are formulated between the ages of three and five, you have decided what the world is like and how to function in it, how to get along in it. The difficulty that we have with that is, how much life wisdom did you have between the ages of three and five? And the answer is, almost none. That is why God provided parents who were supposed to have the responsibility for teaching us not only facts and information, but wisdom on how to behave. And he also gave instructions that your children were to be corrected. Because we are fallen creatures, no one is capable of living a perfect life. And we have corrupted faculties. You have a will that is resistant to being told what to do. It is resistant to authority. It is prone to rebellion. This is part of the corruption of man that happened at the fall. And if it were not for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming to live a human life and pay the penalty for 
all human sin, because he was infinite, there would be no hope for us. And that would be perfectly fair. It would be just. Because we have that fallen nature. And it's a difficult thing to comprehend. But I would, com I would compassionately beg you, consider not just an old man's advice, but read the Word of God for yourself and discover what God says about us. Because God is not condemning us. He's just giving us the most accurate mirror you can ever look into. Well, <clears throat> let me go back to the spirit of man. There are a couple of other things that psychologists might, or you know, uh, other bright people, might tell you what they are, that your imagination is part of your mind. But I would suggest to you that it is not. It's not a mental faculty. It is part of your spirit. Because that is what allows you to uh, engage your own creativity. You can think outside the box, if you will, with imagination. If you didn't have imagination, this would be a very dull world. But there is also a faculty that is called the understanding in the scriptures. And Paul, in one uh, book of to the Corinthian church, talked about people who had the eyes of their understanding darkened. The understanding is therefore a spiritual faculty. It is accessed through the mind, though. Let us jump into the description of the soul that I believe is accurate, and for which you are responsible, because you, the inner person, are responsible for all that was given to you, how you use it. If you gain understanding of yourself, it's going to make life a lot easier because you can understand when am I in agreement with my Creator's guidebook. And you know, the Bible can be looked at as an acronym, B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instruction Before Leaving Earth. That's a good one. I think you ought to hold on to that. But let's go back. In the soul, you obviously have a mind. I look at it as your soul is your hand with which you contact life on planet Earth. You have a mind, it's the strongest part of your soul. You have a will, it's your directive faculty. Yes or no, or I want this or that. You have emotions that are very strong, and we won't get into how we use this finger to express that. We also have desires. In Western society and Christian, Christian society, the wedding ring is placed on the desire finger. That isn't by chance. Then you have the, the smallest finger on your hand, your little pinky. It wasn't made just to scratch your ears and you know, clean out your eyes. It's the most sensitive one. And that can be looked at as the faculty called the sensibilities. In the 18th century, that was very great. Remember a novel called Sense and Sensibility? Well, that is your aesthetic faculty with which you appreciate the beauty of life around you, how you enjoy music. When you smell a rose, it's not just your sense of smell that's involved. It's your whole being that is appreciating something so delicate yet so beautiful yet so appealing to both the eyes and the nose. That is your inner man engaging with God's creation through your sensibilities. We all would be sad beings indeed if we didn't have sensibilities. So let's look at your hand in that respect. But now let me use the hand to illustrate something else, and that is the three-part being that you have. God created you as spirit, soul, and body. He intended that your spirit would be, if you didn't make evil choices and if you were a perfect being as a created man, your spirit would be in total control of your soulical being and of your body. Your appetites of the flesh wouldn't rule you, neither would the desires of your heart, your emotions, your will. These would all be in perfect balance and harmony. That's what the original plan was. 
When man sinned, he turned the world upside down. Now, what God designed to be the weakest element in your life experience, your body rules just about everything. And your appetites can consume you. Then you have your solical being, and last of all, what God intended to be the strongest is now in the weakest position, and it is ruled by what we, the Bible calls the flesh, your body and your soul. When you have really come to understand and are convinced that you are a fallen creature and that you need the redemption that is found in Jesus Christ, that means He paid the price for your sins, and if you will repent and ask Him for forgiveness and mercy, He does. And if you ask Him for a new identity, because Jesus said you have to be born again, you have to have that life from above. If you receive that and you do by asking for it and opening your heart, that is the act of being in submission to God and receiving His truth as it is. When that happens, your life begins to be turned back in the way God intended it to be. You understand and receive instruction from God's Word through your spirit. Yes, that is, we put it in through our solical faculties. We use our mind and we do what God said. Isn't it interesting that God instructed Joshua if he wanted success going into the promised land where there were hosts of armies filled with fallen people who had chosen to violate all that God intended for man. They made idols. They became involved with demonic spirits. They became, became occultists, if you will. And the Old Testament is very clear that the earth before the flood was no longer a place that was even appealing to inhabit. And that's why God destroyed it. We're coming to a close of this age in which the behavior of man has become so abhorrent to God. He has also described our age, the age we're living in, where evil is called good and good is called evil. It's diversity, you know, and that's what's accepted in the politically correct culture of globalists who don't want God's laws to abide by. And so we're in this historical period that is very crucial. How do we conduct ourselves? As Christians, we believe that we submit ourselves to the Word of God and we follow the same instructions that God gave Joshua when he was about to conquer, if you will, the land of Judea and Samaria. God said, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. In doing that, you will be successful. You will, be, you will have the strength to overcome the difficulties you will confront. You see, God was telling man through his instruction to Joshua that the Word of God has power to transform you and to equip you for life on the earth. If you reject the counsel of God against yourself, you have no excuses and you will not come into his kingdom. Because Jesus said you must be born again. You must ask for that new identity so that you can have a new destiny. It is God's desire out of his great love and compassion for every single being on the earth that they would accept his love, be transformed by his grace and his mercy. You see, Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship, and it is a relationship of love and trust. It enables you not only to trust God, but to trust other people. That's a dicey situation for most of us and a lot of people, isn't it? But God gives you 
his ability to live the life he wants us to be living. So those are crucial things to understand. We must reprogram the negative things that have been taken into our spirits through life experience and through inheriting a fallen, corrupt nature. Our minds are not clear, perfect, computerized programs that don't fail. We have corrupt minds, we have corrupt desires, we have corrupt wills, and yet we have the ability to choose good. And when we accept God's nature and His Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us, and that's where 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 come into play. Paul said to these people who were living in this idolatrous culture of Greece, he said, don't you know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, and you are not your own, you have been bought with a price. That applies only to people who have truly repented, who have truly seen the light. You know, you don't have to live very long before you find that you are making some pretty big blunders in life. That's just the nature of being on planet Earth. You can, as a young person, have great dreams and ideals and goals and hopes. But you will find it is impossible to fulfill those on your own. I was blessed by God in that even though I had a hideous family life when I was young and my father abandoned me and my sister and my mother when I was 14, I had diff great difficulties in my early life, but I had lived in a small community where there was an active Baptist church that taught the Word of God plainly and clearly, and I was fortunate enough to have been born in a time and growing up after World War II when America was probably 80% Bible-believing, law-abiding Christians. That made an enormous difference in life because I encountered Christ young when I was a child. I understood the Word clearly and I accepted Him. That doesn't mean that I became a perfect person. In fact, through all my difficulties of readjusting, moving from a small farming community of only 200 people where everyone knew everyone else and where it was easy to have friends, to Los Angeles, California, where the students carried switchblades. It was a major shock, culturally, and hard to adjust to. It took me years to wade through the problems that I brought to myself and that other people brought to me. But God is gracious and He enables you. And my life does have some very good success stories in it. It was by His grace He began to open doors for me through schooling. And I went through a bachelor's and a master's at UCLA in Los Angeles. He continued to open doors for me. I taught at Arizona State. I went to the University of Wisconsin was able in three years to get a PhD only because he was with me at every step of the way. God is amazing in his ability. He can put you in situations you never dreamed of being in. I never thought that I would go that far and become a university professor. Are you kidding me? I would have been happy playing with my baseball in that little town having farmers for friends, and being one myself. That would have satisfied me when I was young. But God opened doors, and He opened my ability to understand. And that's where we go back to the issue of the mind. The mind is not just a thinker. It is an avenue to wisdom. We have two faculties in the mind. We have memory, and we have reason. With reason, we can have inductive or deductive logic. 
We can use analogical and analytical uh, forms of thinking in order to gain understanding. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that your understanding is not part of your mental makeup in your brain. It is in the spirit. That can also, as Paul said, contains eyes of your spirit that can be opened. Your understanding has no limits. That is why you can continue learning throughout your life if you commit yourself to it. You can learn new, new languages, new talents, new skills. Because the spirit of man is made by God, it can expand without limits. And that's the wonderful part. That's what we enjoy seeing people excel. Because it tells us we can do the same. So these things are interesting aspects of the spirit. From the mind, we send knowledge and information into this compartment in the spirit that looks like it's part of the mind, but it's not really. It's far bigger, far more powerful. It's called that understanding. And there we file information, and with the understanding, moved upon by both your will and desires, and the interaction with the Holy Spirit, you can gain new insight that you couldn't even figure out with your brain. It's, that is called the aha factor. That's when you get it. That is what is delightful about being alive. You get new stuff. You find new insight. And when you couple yourself in relationship with God's own Holy Spirit within you, He begins to have delight in your success and he gives you more he opens your understanding further than you could on your own steam now that is an exciting life and friends the most exciting part of it all is that will never end for those of us who have accepted christ we have accepted his life we have been willing to hand over ours and say, Lord, this one stinks. Please give me the new model. And he does. He gives you a heavenly identity. You have to learn how to control the old outer nature through the power of his word working in your spirit to transform you and give you not only the ability but the authority to rule your own natural identity. And that is when the life of God begins to come out and be made manifest in you. Further, that is when those glorious things happen. You know, when I was a young boy, I wanted to play the piano. And I got to take lessons for a couple of years. But I wasn't, life did not give me that opportunity to pursue that. Nevertheless, I have the faintest inkling of what music theory is about. And when I listen to pianists, if I listen to Chopin or Rachmaninoff or any of the other great classical composers, I'm stunned by the amazing abilities that these men had through understanding music theory and having developed their manual skills to such an astonishing degree, they could produce music that is virtually impossible for us to conceive that a person could play the piano that well. But go on YouTube, have a blast. You will encounter all kinds of talented young people and every generation adds new ones and adds to these things. But they have learned how to train their spirit even though they may not have asked God for a new identity. What a tragedy to have enjoyed such phenomenal success here and through discipline to arrive at such amazing abilities and yet for it to all be over when you die. God wants you to live eternally with Him in a new heaven and a new earth. Those are promises in His book. This guidebook of life is not a bunch of four, uh, fairy stories. It is not a mythology textbook, as your atheist 
university professors would probably like you to believe. You know, I earned that highest degree they give in the university studying literature. And I taught in five American universities, in two foreign ones, three foreign ones. Never dreamed that my life would be fulfilled with those kinds of successes. I won't tell you about the failures. There were a lot of them. I walked away from my profession and lost it in the U.S. That was my folly. But where that profession has gone, I am thankful I have no part in it. Because it is living out politicized lies and perversions of the truths of life that God has clearly explored, explained, developed, and demonstrated in the Bible. This is the most amazing book that you will ever lay hands on. Why? Because it's so interesting in history and poetry and testimonies of the way Jesus lived. Not just that, but it has power to transform you. Jesus said, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, to the Jews who had already believed in him, if you continue in my word, that's the evidence that you're really my student, my disciple. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Remember I quoted that scripture in Thessalonians. This word also works effectively in those who believe. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, Paul spoke of it another way. He said the word of God is living. It is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. He used it in comparison to a butcher knife. When you're cleaning, cutting a chicken, you can cut between the bones and the marrow. But this one is sharper than that. It can divide between the soul and the spirit. It can open your own inner being for you. It can show you how, what patterns of thought have ruled your life and by studying God's Word and asking Him for grace and mercy, you can overcome bad habits. You can change your way of thinking and understanding. And you can get insight into the world to come. All of that is available if you will, number one, humble yourself. You are not a king or a queen. You are not going to live forever and you face eternal separation from your Creator if you don't take life, eternal life, on His terms. He's the only one who knows what the terms are and you need to accept those terms. That is one of the wonderful things that can happen. This three-part nature this five-dimension soul can be saved by your submission to the Word of God. Because when you come to love Jesus for what He has done, to trust Him, to give you the gift of eternal life, and to keep you until the end. Because you see, the Bible says, those who endure to the end will be saved. And you need to understand that you have the capacity to walk away from God at any time in your life because He gave you free will. But His Holy Spirit will keep you and Jesus said, no one else can take you out of His hand. These are marvelous assurances. These are wonderful promises. And they do allow you to experience the very best that God can give you in this life. Well, I pray that this time together will have been instructive for you, but also convicting, also drawing you to really get to know that the Lord Jesus Christ died so that you could live with Him forever. God does love you. He has made provision for you. He can protect you. He can keep you, and He can bring you home to you with Daddy forever. It's a marvelous life if you will embrace it. 
I pray that you will come to God's Word, find the life and the power that is in it, and live a life of gratitude and joy, because that is what God intends for us, a life that is filled with joy, despite the hardships that you may have. There is still joy in knowing that you have something waiting for you that will never, ever be destroyed and never, ever disappoint. Well, I leave you with those thoughts to ponder, and I just speak the blessing of God's mercy and grace over everyone who hears this word and determines, yes, I will take that life. Remember, when the day of your need, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, that is the name of Jesus, shall be saved. Goodbye.